So, Dr. Kandel, you said call you Eric, but He's I- gotta I, call me Eric. But I, I'm too intimidated. <laughs> yes, um, I intimidate you so terribly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the title of your book, The Disordered Mind, What Unusual Brains Tell Us About Ourselves. Okay, what do unusual brains tell us about ourselves? Well, in neurology, uh, it's been well known that many functions of the body were understood as different lesions in the brain occurred and interfered with reflex behavior, with speech, with hearing, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't clear that things that were not clearly neurological, things that would be more psychiatric, aspects of behavior, of thought, uh, would also be represented in brain. In fact, many people thought that the brain mediates neurological function and the psyche, which is outside the brain, mediates behavioral functions that are involved in psychological disorders and normal psychological function. We now know that that's not true, that the brain mediates everything. It mediates both psychological behavior and neurological behavior. So your book is very optimistic about grave and serious subjects. Is it that there's just been an incredible amount of progress in this area, which was amazing, amazing, amazing. When I was a medical student, uh, the only visualizations we had of the brain were x-rays and variations of that, like pneumoencephalography. That allowed you to see the ventricles, and allowed you to see the outer layers of uh, the skull, and even the inner surface of the skull. It didn't allow you to see the brain itself. Now we have wonderful imaging techniques that allow you to see the whole brain in situ, different regions of the brain. And we can even have people do psychological tasks to see whether or not the normal uh, regions light up. So the progress has been really enormous. Well, has, has there also been a lot of progress because of research in other areas like genetics? Um, on the mark, on absolutely the mark. right. Genetics, particularly of psychiatric and neurological illnesses, were when I was a medical student, you know, a century ago, uh, 50, 60 years ago, were very limited. Now we have a much better understanding of genetics of various kinds of things. Still, by no means complete, but we have many prototypic examples that we can drive home so we can see how important the impact of genes on behavior can be. Well, in the, certainly in the 1950s when you were training, people kind of felt that the brain and neuroscience, it was sort of like a black hole within science that we'd get to the moon faster, and indeed we did. I, um, I, think, you, I, <laughs> I think you make a good point. Uh, there's probably, relatively speaking, been more progress in understanding the brain and how it relates to neurological and psychiatric disorders than most areas of medicine. Because we were so backward, particularly in terms of psychiatry, that this has been a major advance. We've got a long way to go. Our biological understanding of psychiatric disorders is still very limited, but at least we have a handle that we can go forward with. Well, it's, it's not a doomed state now. Not at all. Which... Not at all. It's a very optimistic state. So when you when you trained to be a psychotherapist, well, let me ask, why did you choose that as, as a life calling? You were a very smart young man. You... Uh, I, I, uh, when I was in college yeah. at Harvard, uh, I got to know a woman by the name of Anna Chris, whose father, Ernst Chris, was a, a quite outstanding art historian. He was Gombrich's teacher, but then he met a woman Mariana, who uh, was very close to Anna Freud and to Sigmund Freud, and she got a interest in psychoanalysis, and he became an outstanding psychoanalyst. And I got to know him quite well, and he really influenced me a great deal in terms of thinking about psychoanalysis for understanding the mind as a way to go. But I, I read somewhere that part of what motivated you was having grown up in Nazi Vienna. Yes, I wanted to understand how people could listen to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven one day and beat up the Jews the next. I really wanted to understand how people function like that. And so 
the Chris has helped me realize that I could, wasn't going to do that through intellectual history. I majored in history and literature at Harvard. They said, this is not the way to go. You've got to really understand the brain. You've got to understand the mind. You've got to do it through psychoanalytic approaches and biological underpinnings of that. And that changed my mind. I started to take pre-med courses so I could go to medical school with the idea of becoming a psychoanalyst. Well, did you learn anything on that huge topic? Did I got better insights in the functioning of the human mind, and a number of those ideas influenced me later on. I mean, one of the reasons I've worked with problems like memory and other things related to mental functioning is because of my early interest. Yeah. We, we talked earlier, or I, I spoke about how rare it is that there's somebody of your level of attainment who writes also so well. Um, how did writing begin for you? Um, well, I've, I've always enjoyed writing. You know, there's an old cliche, how do I know what I think unless I read what I write? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I've always felt that way. And I wrote uh, in high school. Uh, I was editor, sports editor of the Dutchman. And I also wrote for- At Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn. Which was an outstanding high school in its day. And I wrote for uh, a newspaper called Gotham Sports a private newspaper called Breaking the Tape with Eric Kandel. Uh, so I was uh, enjoyed doing writing. Um, well, within the academic world, popular writing isn't always approved of. I mean, there's a kind of envy, you, too. You're absolutely, I'm not sure it's envy. Um, um, a very good friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Schwartz, um, he and I would rehearse our talks. Uh, and I would sometimes step back after one of his talks and say, you know, Jimmy, I know you work intimately, but I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> and he said, Eric, you don't understand that. At Rockefeller, where I was trained, they taught you, if your talk is too simple, they think you're simple-minded. So you have to be in part confusing. I said, you can't believe that. He didn't change his mind. He continued to give rather poor talks, maybe <laughs> after a few years. I, I think they've improved at Rockefeller. They don't do that there anymore. I, that was many years yes, ago at Rockefeller, yes. yes. Um, your, your Nobel colleague, Paul Greengard, Greengard. Is, is one of the clearest Wonderful. persons yes. I know, and he's yes. at Rockefeller. Absolutely. Um, getting back to the thing that it propelled you in, into psychoanalysis. Um, you were a refugee child. Uh, when you see refugees on television now and how children are being treated, does it bring things up for you? Yes. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult to go from one country to another, particularly when you're fleeing, as we were doing. Um, I was very fortunate that I um, I had a fairly easy transition. Uh, when I came to the United States, my brother and I preceded our parents, and we lived with our grandparents, who had preceded us by a few months. And they were brought over by one of their children who had been settled in the United States for some time and could provide the affidavits and also the resources to support them. Uh, and my grandfather always wanted to have an influence on me uh, greater than he had in Vienna in terms of my religious attitudes. And um, he suggested that if I allowed him to tutor me in Hebrew, I would probably be eligible for the Yeshiva Flatbush, which is a very good a parochial school that I would enjoy a great deal. And I had started in a regular public high school. And um, in Vienna, somehow, you could easily tell the difference between kids who are Jewish and kids who are not. The Jewish kids tend to be dark-haired, non-Jewish kids tend to be blonde and blue-eyed. Well, in my PS217 class, almost everyone was blonde and blue-eyed, even though it turned out afterwards it was a Jewish day, but a lot of kids in that class must have been Jewish. But I got paranoid already a little bit, so when my grandfather suggested he tutor me in Hebrew over the summer so I can go to the yeshiva flapush, that sounded a very attractive way to get out of PS217. So I did that, and I went to the yeshiva flapush, which was actually quite good. It, being here as a refugee, as an eight-year-old, 
Was it tough? Uh, at the beginning, it was tough, but once I began to go to the Yeshiva Club, which once I began to be more comfortable, once I began to speak English quite well, I found it very, very, I've never been discriminated against. I've never said, felt any anti-Semitism in this country. Uh, you know, I went to Harvard, I went to all kinds of places where you could have accounted that, uh, and I never experienced it. Now, one possibility is that I didn't seek out situations in which you could find that. So, for example, while I was at Harvard, there were lots of clubs, hasty putting many other clubs, uh, and to belong to them, there was, a, I'm sure, a, a quota system where I could sort of tell they didn't have many Jewish kids in them. But I had no interest in that. I was interested in two things, books and girls, and that, yeah. <laughs> that had no quota. <laughs> uh, to ask this delicately without becoming too political, uh, you experienced in Vienna, uh, you saw what mass thinking and mass behavior could do. We're seeing a lot of mass behavior now does it scare you? Does it worry you? It scares me and worries me. I, I must say, um, speaking just about uh, being a Jew, I've never felt even the, the remotest similarity in anti-Semitism here to the kind that was fairly routine in Vienna even before Hitler came in and just became just unbearable after Hitler came in. So then you get the Nobel Prize, and as you famously said, now the Austrians are claiming me. Uh, well, because they, they called me up and they said, isn't it wonderful, you know, an <laughs> yes. <and, and> Austrian <laughs> Nobel Prize. I said, I think you've got this wrong. This is an American Nobel, an American Jewish Nobel Prize. I thought I'd give it to those bastards. <laughs> 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 and what was their reaction? Uh, uh, they, you know, flipped over and tried to be as nice as possible. Yeah. Um, they invited me to Vienna, and we went. And uh, they've put up a very nice plaque in the building that this came over a period of years, and the building that my parents and I lived in, which lists our four names, Hermann Kandel, Charlotte Kandel, Ludwig Kandel, and myself, Eich Kandel, and also two other uh, Jewish people who lived in the building. What happened to them? I don't know what happened to those two people. I didn't even realize there were two other people in the building who were Jewish because there were a lot of people living in that building in a Poppin house. So I didn't know them at all. Yeah. Let's talk neuroscience a little yes. and some of the changes that we've seen in, in, in the last few years. When you first started, psychotherapy was, well, I wouldn't say the mode, but it, it was the place to be, uh, psychoanalysis, people went into long-term therapies, and then it completely stopped. One of the things I sense in your new book is that you're trying to find sort of a, a middle ground. Yes. Uh, can you explain yes. that a little more? Um, I'm extremely disappointed with psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, not because I think that there isn't a lot to it, but um, I find that most let me not speak about individual analysts. I think the analytic organization is not scientifically oriented. For example, one of the first things you and I would do if we were interested in the development of psychoanalysis or psychotherapy is to try to do outcome studies to see whether or not this form of psychotherapy works and that kind of psychotherapy doesn't, what kinds of therapists is best with patients, you know, are women, psychotherapists better with women patients and not as good with men patients, or doesn't it make any difference? These questions, which are routine, would come to most of our minds, was not in the mind of anyone doing psychotherapy in, in the United States for the longest time. Because Freud was right, period. There's nothing to add. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was a fatal mistake. Yes, fatal mistake. I mean, every discipline is capable of growth, within certain reasonable limits. Questions can be asked, and particularly if you're dealing with something which is therapeutically oriented, outcome studies are essential. People only began to do outcome studies very recently for the longest time. They didn't do any outcome studies in psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. So you, you, 
the one area of that discipline you're enthusiastic about is cognitive therapy. Yes. Why? Well, because Aaron Beck, from the very beginning, demanded outcome studies. And he actually showed that, you know, this works and this doesn't work. And that was not carried out in other areas. So what was the effect when uh, psychotherapeutic drugs started coming along and being widely adopted? And Fantastic impact an enormous impact on psychiatry. Um, you had to weed out, you know, what, what are the drugs that work and what are the drugs that don't work and what are the doses you use, but it's had a tremendously beneficial effect on this. And not only that, but, you know, there is now that outcome studies have been done, but even as before the outcome studies were done, one had the sense that in many cases psychotherapy was extremely helpful. And you now have drugs in combination with psychotherapy you really can help people much more than you could before. And yet, uh, when you were studying, the place to be was studying psychiatry at McLean and at Harvard. That's not the place to be now. Um, McLean? Well, it, I guess, um, but it's, it's <laughs> not, I'm not saying as a patient, but I'm, more seriously, uh, as, as a therapist, it's good, but it's, it's not of the moment. I don't, don't want to get into the hassle with you. I think, okay. I, th I think it's actually quite good. Um, th I think what you could argue with them, although they're, they're really overcoming that, is that the fraction of effort that they put into analyzing what goes on and how to improve therapeutic approaches is, is limited compared to with the need. Uh, but they're certainly doing outcome studies and doing, seeing what happens in psychotherapy and also the different forms of psychotherapy, which form is better for what patients, etc. They have a significant research program at McLean. You did, as part of your training, some psychotherapy. You, yes, you, you I liked went. it. Yes. Did, did it, was it helpful? Uh, first of all, I had my own psychotherapy, which yeah. I was even more obnoxious yeah. before than I am now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did it help? Uh, and uh, I enjoyed doing psychotherapy. And in fact, for a while, when I was doing science more seriously, I thought that maybe I would do uh, psychotherapy one day a week. Then I said to myself, would you like to go to a physician who practices medicine one day a week? It's just <laughs> absurd. Uh, so I gave that up. Uh -huh. uh, but I enjoyed it, and uh, you know, I think in good hands, it can be very effective. So let's talk about aging. I'd we, we, we all have to think about it, and if we're lucky, we, we have to plan for it. Um, what have you learned as, as this beat kind of came to you about the aging brain? It's amazing, because you and I have never discussed the aging brain, and I've become very fascinated with it recently. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I found out something very interesting, which I find quite encouraging. Um, Chirat Kasenki uh, at Columbia, uh, a very good uh, geneticist, uh, has been interested in a hormone released by bone called osteocalcin. Uh, osteocalcin uh, gets into the brain, does a number of things. Uh, and one of the things that is really amazing is that it seems to reverse age-related memory loss. You can show this quite effectively in experimental animals. Mice, for example, show age-related memory loss. Not Alzheimer's. I'm speaking both in humans mm -hmm. and in experimental animals with age-related memory loss. They can't find their way around the maze. Exactly. Well. But if you give them some osteocalcin, they improve. And you can have an old mouse act like a young mouse with a high dose of osteocalcin. And I'm beginning to think that this might be true also. The evidence is much more restricted so far. Might be true in people. And I'm switching from swimming to walking. Because you want weight-bearing exercise. Right, because osteocalcin is released when you walk, when you bang. Huh. I'm always trying to get my husband to work on the Nautilus machines, and he won't. And Another reason, because it rebuilds Absolutely, power. but get him to walk a couple oh, of miles a day. He, he, he's your age, and he is teaching his 140th semester. At wow. Case. 
college in Queens, and he walks part I mean, of the He way. walks there. Well, he walks from the subway and from the I way. think that's terrific. I've started to do that also just really recently. Uh, uh, I live in 116th Street, and my laboratory is 131st Street, so I now walk both ways every day. Just I've been doing this just a relatively short period of time. But I think it's a very good thing to do. Um, the aging brain. Uh, I recently spoke with a researcher who does autopsies on long-lived uh, people who will her their brain. And one of the things she found was in looking at their brains, that there were people who had uh, the, the pathological symptoms of Alzheimer's and dementia, that is, the plaque and the amyloid, and yet in life there were no signs of that. And everybody's thought that it's the plaque that's creating the Alzheimer's, but she's found people who have that and s seemed in life un not demented. Yes. So, so Yes, that's, there that, to it? that's not surprising. Um, there are drugs available right now uh, that are quite effective uh, against uh, Alzheimer's disease um, in principle. They prevent the formation of new plaques and new tangles, um, but they don't work in people. Huh. And uh, the reason clinicians think they don't work in people is because by the time somebody shows symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, they've lost so many nerve cells that stopping further death of nerve cells doesn't do anything for them, and you can't grow back what you've lost. That's the tragedy of nerve cells. If I damage my skin, those cells will regrow. You damage the brain, nerve cells do not regrow. Mm. So if you've lost nerve cells, no matter how effective the treatment is in preventing further nerve cell loss, you can't compensate for the fact that you've already lost enough to give you a memory deficit. So with people with dementia, once they've gone past At the zero, moment, it looks that way. Perhaps with time, we can do something. But the moment it looks, once people have dementia, you can stop the further progression, but you cannot reverse what one has. Hmm. Um, we, we talked once about new drugs and therapies that could erase painful memories. And I remember asking you if you could erase the memories of what you went through in Vienna as a child, would you? No. Why not? That's me. <laughs> I mean, I am what I am because of the experiences that I've had. Uh, now, granted, none of these were sufficiently traumatic. Maybe under some circumstances, there will be some things that I would like to erase. I would think the kinds of things one would most want to erase are horrible things one has done oneself, because those are the things you feel most bad about, I would think. Thank God I've been limited in being a reasonably good boy. Uh, but I, I, th I think that that's really the key thing, yeah. So. Maybe some of these new technologies are not a good idea. Um, maybe it's science fiction a la Rod Serling, who always had that message that maybe we shouldn't use this stuff. Well, it depends on, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, if, if somebody's developing a loss of memory, and if you stop that and it doesn't progress any further, person still has, you know, considerable capability of storing new memories. That's a wonderful thing to have. So I wanted to ask you about some of the new technologies that are absolutely mind-blowing. CRISPR, will, that's, that's a technology that now exists where they can edit genes. What if um, a lot of mental illness has a genetic component? Uh, what will this mean? Well, there's no question that if one could, you know, at will, remove genes that are not functioning well or, or functioning in a very damaging fashion, if one could replace those with healthy genes, that would be very good. And in certain restricted cases, one can do that. Um, but it's a long way to do this in terms of the brain and more complicated functions. But it's not inconceivable 
that we get to the point where we can replace malfunctioning genes with effective ones. So this optimistic book, um, you've been plowing the fields of neuroscience one way or the other for 70 years. Where do you think the state of the discipline of humanity, of our brains, will be 70 years from now? Uh, I think it's quite wonderful because there used to be a distinction between the humanities and the sciences. And I have been one of many people who has felt that that's a superficial distinction, um, that it's a unified corpus of knowledge. You know, um, we learn from Shakespeare and from Goethe certain things about the nature of life. We learn from Freud other things about the nature of life. And we learn about biology, other things, nature of life. And we want to put that all together into a coherent view of how different human beings function and how that function can go awry and how we might, we might be able to restore it. Uh, so I think with time, we will bridge across those gaps and develop a very unified view of how the brain works. And the brain and the mind works. And will some of the scourges of, uh, of our everyday lives, uh, for instance, dementia, be curbed, be managed? I, I would think, uh, as I mentioned before, one of the problems with, de with dementia right now is that when a time somebody really shows profound symptoms of having dementia, they've lost a significant number of nerve cells, and you can't regrow nerve cells. Now, maybe through some miracle, if we found some way of stimulating populations of nerve cells so they would all of a sudden start dividing. I mean, I think that's very far-fetched, but I'm giving you one possible solution to the dilemma. Uh, so I think at the moment, without that miracle uh, drug, uh, the way to do this is early diagnosis. Hmm. And maybe everyone should have routine scans when they're 35 or 40 uh, to see whether or not they're beginning to lose nerve cells. And if they are, to a significant degree, intervene at that point before they lose more nerve cells. Well, fascinating. And we've kind of here uh, sort of surveyed some of the many issues that you take up in your book. I'm wondering if we could put the lights on and throw some questions out to the audience. Absolutely. Um, can Don't make them difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, if, if we can put on the lights so that we can see you. If, if you will, I'll repeat your questions because we're broadcasting, we're live streaming to Friends of the Y around the, the country and the world. Um, say your name and uh, can we turn the lights just a little more because it's really hard to see the audience. Um, a little more? Uh, okay. Um, can you see? Uh, I can see the first five or six rows. Uh, yeah. No, we really need the house lights up. That's much better. There's a, there's a woman in the corner with her hands boldly raised. We like that. Um, yes. I'm seeing, we're seeing much better now. Yes. They're much I'll better. I'll repeat your question after you ask it. Okay. Um, Would you stand up, please? I'm sorry. Well, interesting question. Uh, Julie Tynan asks uh, and mentions that there's been a resurgence in research in psychedelics. And she was wondering what Dr. I thought you said psychoanalysis. Is it? Psychedelic drugs. The psychedelic drugs, I see. Uh -huh. Like LSD. Uh, and, and I know that there are studies going on at NYU right now, um, serious studies. Um, and, and uh, that it's being used to treat depression. And I believe it's being used also to aid people in their dying and, and um, make, make them less fearful. Uh, what is your impression of that? I honestly don't know enough about that to make an informed comment. So uh, there's a question back there and one in front. 
Lloyd Danzig wants to know. <laughs> um, so yeah. we live in this universe of atoms that by themselves are not that interesting, but when they come together in this form of our bodies, somehow they give rise to sentience and consciousness. Uh, and you also had differentiated between the brain uh, and the mind a couple of minutes ago. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just speak to how this happens and what you see as the distinction between the brain and the mind. So the question. That's a very important question. question. And you, when you solve it, you will win a second Nobel. Well, I've solved it. <laughs> you solved it. Ah. Uh, I think there's a misconception. Many people believe that um, there's a brain and there's a mind, and these are different functions. That the brain carries out reflex acts like hitting a backhand in tennis, and the mind carries out falling in love, you know, getting married, getting divorced, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's not correct. The mind is a series of functions carried out by the brain. Every mental act, from the most trivial reflex act, the most sublime ecstatic experience, falling in love, these are all mediated by the brain. So this is just different terminology to describe the actions of a single magnificent organ, the most complicated organ in the universe, the human brain. So, um in the front, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean Isaacson. Um, so I have a question. If you lose the nerve in the brain where those, those cells that die, is there, are there other aspects of the brain that you can retrain? Yes. Pathways? Um, to yes, find yes, very, very good question. So may I repeat it for people on the internet? The question was if one loses nerve cells in the brain, can you retrain other parts of the brain to pick up? You've just given the answer. Um, you lose I, nerve I cells. Don't have a you, license or a degree. <laughs> you lose nerve cells, you can't get those nerve cells back. But nerve cells have a wonderful capability of growing connections. In fact, one of the things I showed early is learning involves a change in how neurons communicate with each other. So with certain kinds of learning, when you remember something over a long period of time, this nerve cell, which had initially three connections to that nerve cell, now has five connections to that nerve cell. You can also, with certain kinds of learning, called habituation, lose connections. So one of the things, in fact, a key thing that happens with learning is you alter the number of connections between certain nerve cells in the brain. So this is happening all the time. Uh in the corner there. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Yasin Toyas, and I was wondering what, if anything, you believe Freud got right, given the fact that <laughs> psychoanalysis has been criticized for being unscientific. I'm wondering if you think that there are uh, scientific truths that Freud did get at, if any. The question from the gentleman is, did Freud get anything right? He got a lot right. Like. Uh, Freud was keenly aware of the fact that um, he was developing a psychological schema that did not have a biological underpinning. And the reason he was so aware of it is he started out as an outstanding biologist. Uh, he did beautiful work. And the reason I like his work, in fact, appears on the cover of Principles of Neural Science, a textbook with which I've been involved is that he was himself an outstanding neurobiologist. He studied nerve cells, particularly of invertebrate animals. This is one of the reasons I like him so much. Uh, when he moved into psychoanalysis, uh, he stopped working on the brain. He devoted himself full time to sort of psychoanalytic explorations. And he said that when biology reaches the point where it can provide an underpinning for my psychoanalytic speculations, my theory, many of these ideas would be proven to be wrong. But look, one of the surprising things about Freud is that even though he was really quite speculative and he didn't you know, do systematic outcome studies, a number of things that he showed really held up quite well. The uh, fact that there were unconscious mental processes and a lot of your psychic 
activity is unconscious, that there are different uh, levels of unconscious. There's one part has easy access to consciousness, other parts that are deeper buried do not have such ease. So he had, considering the fact that he had very imp little empirical data, some good intuitive insight just from seeing patients. But he realized completely the weakness of this. The problem with psychoanalysis is not Freud. Freud was so successful, everybody and his uncle wanted to get into psychoanalysis. If you come to New York, as we did, so we came here in 1939, by the time I was in high school and college, many of my friends were in analysis, and everybody in the streets, you walk down Broadway, every other person was in analysis. And that's without any outcome studies. People just really grabbed this stuff. So probably there's some benefit, even without any control studies. But it wasn't until recently that people began to do serious outcome studies. It's a shame, absolute shame. There, there was a question behind that. Uh, uh, yeah. And we'll try to get to everyone. Uh, schizophrenia often develops in young adults. Is there any research that indicates what happens in the brain that precipitates schizophrenia? The question is about schizophrenia, and is there new evidence that shows how it's triggered and, and develops? Well, I think there's very good evidence to indicate that there's an important genetic component to the tri triggering of schizophrenia. Uh, that it usually occurs um, in uh, you know, late high school, early college years, when kids are first beginning to have a fairly mature brain and they meet certain stresses that bring them over the top. Um, and uh, so we're beginning to get a better and better understanding of it. But we've got a long way to go. Uh, part of it is because there's an important genetic component and as we get a better handle of that, we might be able to use, you know, pharmacological approaches, perhaps, to nullify the effects of some of those genes. Now, uh, the, the lady in the center. Yeah. Uh. I was raising my hand, but no. <laughs> uh, I'm the lady in the center. Um, my name is Ryan, and um, I have a question about um, Alzheimer's. My grandmother had Alzheimer's, and you mentioned when you were talking that maybe you should get it when you're, you know, looked at when you're 35, 40 years old. So what is the process of that if you want, let's say that you wanted the doctor to look at, you know, if you've lost nerve cells, and how does that process work? Is it gradual? Do they look at it just once? Do they know? Um, how does that work if you want it to go? There are drugs that have an effect on Alzheimer's disease. But the trouble with Alzheimer's disease is once you diagnose it, you've lost sufficient nerve cells that you can never reverse it because nerve cells can't be rescued once they've died. You can't stimulate the growth of new nerve cells. So what's very important in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease is diagnosis before the symptoms are very profound. Yeah, but, but, but how do you know if um, the nerve cells, could it, do you go to the doctor once and they know that you've I'm lost sorry? nerves? Can one do you go to the doctor one time and they know that you've lost nerve cells or is it a gradual thing where you go back every so, so well, often? You, it is a gradual thing, but it's progressive. Uh, I think the young man was wondering how you would diagnose this if you were comparatively younger, perhaps his age. Um, how, how it works that they can tell at a young stage that you might be? Uh, if one were to do periodic imaging of your brain, they would begin to see if you had Alzheimer's disease, the first evidence of nerve cell loss. You could not get those nerve cells back, but you could prevent future nerve cells from dying. People are developing approaches to that. So early diagnosis. So, so if there's any suggestion in a family, there's a history of it, for example. It might be a good idea for everybody, I'm giving an arbitrary age, over the age of 30, to have you know, good imaging of their brain done periodically to see whether or not intervention is necessary. And you go to a neurologist, is that? Uh, a neur neurological exam per se will not reveal that. 
Yeah. So I think what you're suggesting is that people who are concerned get a baseline Absolutely. scan and, and keep following it. Can we go on with some further questions? That's a good question. Over there, all the way in the back, there's somebody asking a question in the far corner. Yes? Hi, my name is uh, Vitaly. And uh, my question is really more about meditation and uh, ah. how much of that can we carry over and maybe staff off uh, neural degeneration, even if it's hereditary? I, I'm sorry, I don't follow the question. I don't follow either. It, it, what, what are you what asking role, about meditation? Well, what role does it play in uh, maybe even combating, combating any neural degeneration that may be hereditary? Can meditation maybe uh, do the same effect as some of the leading drugs that we're still using? So the question is, is meditation effective in combating some mental problems? Am I correct? Yes. It, oh. it may be and it may not be. We don't know. See, the trouble with a lot of these sort of psychotherapeutically oriented or parallels is that people get this idea. They try it in a few patients. It looks a little bit encouraging. And they think it works. But there's so much placebo effect that goes on, you know, just interacting with another person, being th supportive of them, that you don't know whether it's the particular modality you're using or the relationship that you're establishing with the person. So you really need to do systematic outcome studies to do controls, blah, 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 in order to see whether or not this particular psychotherapeutic intervention is truly beneficial. And that's hard to do, and it's not done enough because it is a little bit difficult to do. So let, let's sort of, as they say on Jeopardy, do a lightning round, because we have very few moments. Quick questions, one, two, three. Okay. My name is <coughs> Batya Silvera, and I know a professor in Israel. His name is um, Shai Efrati, and he does chamber treatment. He has eight people or 12 people in a, in a chamber, and he makes a nurse sitting there with them and um, breathes oxygen and he says that it's supposed to help memory to me remember and many other things <laughs> people to cure them so if what can i operation. ask what the question i want to ask you if if this oxygen pure oxygen that they're breathing for two hours every 20 minutes they have a break and then and then he is saying that this, and the people are coming from all over the world to do this treatment of oxygen. Okay, oxygen. may I that cut you short because we're running short of time. Yeah, the question is, does oxygen therapy help to revive some of the cells in the brain? Does oxygen therapy help? Yeah. I have not the foggiest notion. Can you give me some papers that show that it works? Yeah. And, and can we go on and ask some additional questions? Yes. Uh, the, the woman right there. Uh. Hi, I'm Whitney Peeling. Um, you have an amazing chapter in the book about gender. And I I'm wonder sorry? about gender in the book where you talk about what neuroscience has taught us about gender. Could you talk? What has a bit about that? You have a very interesting chapter on Ben Barris on Ben Barris and on people who ha are biologically uh, malassigned by gender. Right. right. Um, do you want to talk about what you? Uh, actually, there's now a systematic attack, particularly at the Brigham, when this is diagnosed early, to help people who are uncomfortable being in a male body when they want to be female or vice versa to follow them for a while, and if this is really a consistent pattern, to help them biologically adjust to the sex they were not born into. And, and there's a chapter about a, 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 a scientific researcher named Ben, ben Barris, who was born Barbara. And I, I don't know if you knew Ben or Barbara. I knew him. Yeah, I did too, and he- uh, An excellent scientist. An excellent scientist who had been born a woman and never forgot what that felt like. So he would go to uh, conferences and people would say to him, Ben, your sister. Is so much better than you were. Or no, no, the opposite. 
You're so much better than your sister. Uh, they, they, they made a comparison. I find it uh, hilarious. I got it wrong, but the important thing was thinking. Well, he never forgot the lesson of what living as a woman had right. meant, and so he was a great supporter of women in science. We're going to take one or two more questions, and then we're going to have to um, go to the other room for book signing. I, over there, yes, please. You are Louise Contino. And Louise my, Contino, my student. <laughs> I'm your student. Yes. And my question to you is, I, I saw in the description to your book, which I've not had the chance to read yet, that you talked about people who were born uh, with a neuroatypical development, such as autism. And I'm just curious what kind of insight you've gleaned from studying autism, how it's helped you understand the brain better. Yes, L Louise Contino wanted to know how studying autism helps you understand the brain better. Well, you see there's a specific defect with autism that people have difficulty really interacting with other people in a personal fashion, and you realize this is a important trait and that lacking that tremendously interferes with human interactions. So it really shows you how just the action of one or two genes can alter the brain in such a dramatic way that the normal human interaction that you and I enjoy, even at the moment, you're nodding your head and I'm speaking to you, we're communicating in nonverbal ways that is very significant. That's lacking in autistic kids. And, and while we're on this topic, you know, there's a book out now about Dr. Asperger, a, uh, a biography of him, who was, I believe, Viennese, right? Yes, and a bit of a Nazi, wasn't he? N more than a bit of a Nazi, he helped, uh, or he permitted the murder of some of his patients yes. with Asperger's syndrome. What do you make of, I mean, it's an obvious Awful. question. Awful. Well, how, how did it happen? How could it happen? People allowing their patients to be murdered. If you realize what happened in the Nazi period, how physicians carried themselves on, it's just disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. Yeah. So, a question over there from the far corner, ma'am. Sir, I, I can uh, Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry? Um, Does alcohol destroy nerve cells in the brain? In, in small doses, and that's a tricky definition, it doesn't. But there's no question that large amounts of alcohol can be damaging to the brain. They're and, and quite toxic. In the, in the middle, of, in the back, uh, person in white. So thank you so much. This is so interesting. I'm Jenny Feinberg. Um, my question to you is for somebody who knows so much about memory. Um, so I do a lot of sort of my own research and my own interest in memory, and I'm a physician, so I, I have a lot of different kinds of interests. What would you recommend to improve memory? The question is, and we all want to know this, how can one improve memory? Um, I don't think there's a proven way to do this except to practice. Uh, but I am beginning to believe that this story of osteocalcin could be quite important, and that is walking, which exercises the bones, leads to release of osteocalcin. It's very good for memory processes in the brain. So it's possible that if we can establish this rigorously, that that would be a very good thing. And it's interesting, you speak to, uh, uh, I don't know whether you know Brenda Milner. Yeah. Brenda Miller is 100 years old, and she was really one of the great sort of cognitive psychologists. She studied HM, um, and she walks to work. Even at this particular point, when she's 100 years old, I was just at a 100th birthday celebration, walks to work every single day. So walking is a much, much better exercise than people realize. They thought it was just routine, you know, um, that it, it probably is a very, very good thing to walk several miles a day, to walk to and from work if you possibly can. I'm trying to do this now. Um. Well, we all know that Brenda Milner is just a miracle, miracle. a wondrous person. Miracle. Well, but you are too. And, and, and do, you, do you credit the fact that you are still working and still producing 
as part of your longevity, uh, that going yes, to work is I, a I day. think I certainly, I go to work because I enjoy it, and I have no uh, intention of quitting, although I may have to, but also I've got a wonderful life. I've got a wife who is just a terrific partner, uh, and we, she is slightly younger than I am, but she's working every bit as much as I am. So I have a very privileged personal life, which is very important. So I think a number of things have to add up to allow you to enjoy your 80s to the degree that you're capable of enjoying it. But I, I can't imagine you as someone playing croquet or, um, <laughs> or doing the things that people in, in your cohort are supposed to be doing. I'm not sure they're supposed to be doing it. I, you know, I, I come with, up with a new finding or a new idea, no matter how crappy it is, I'm so thrilled with it <laughs> uh, that it just gives me a lot of pleasure. I enjoy writing, even though it takes me many drafts to get it right. Um, you know, I, I get pleasure out of the intellectual work. That I, I call it intellect, it's not that intellectual. The, the, the research work that I do at every level, I get a lot of pleasure out of it. We, we, we'll take one more question, the person in the middle there, and then we, alas, must call it an evening. Sir. Hey, my name's Ian. I just want to know what you think about um, dualism, uh, idea of the ghost in the machine with all that you know about the brain. What, is, what are your thoughts about dualism? Can you define dualism, please? Uh, basically, the existence of the soul um, in addition to the material brain. Uh, what do you think about souls? I think there's nothing to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've got a brain and it makes you, everything that you think and you feel and you behave and you fantasize all comes from your brain. So take care of your brain. It's very valuable. Well, that, that's wonderful parting advice. <laughs> Thank you. You're wonderful. You're great.